okay, so now we're going to think, uh, why are there cities? Like, what's the point? Like, what's, why is, you know, why do humans congregate in these, um, you know, uh, metro- uh, metropolises? You know, why not everyone just have, you know, an equal sized plot of land evenly spread uh, throughout the globe? Why do we congregate? Why do we live on top of each other um, in these crowded cities? As I mentioned, you know, think about LA. LA was a backwater. You know, it was, you know, basically a rural area, like a trading outpost, very violent. Um, and today, you know, a premier world city and the second largest, um, second largest in the U.S., but of course the best city. I mean, um, you know, much better than New York. If you've ever been to New York, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. And so if it turns out basically if each piece of land was the same, if, <coughs> excuse me, if everywhere in the world, the land was exactly the same, and if people were the, exactly the same in terms of what their skills and, and talents were, in terms of what they could do, and there were no increasing returns to scale, meaning as, we, as our operation gets larger, there, you know, we get more efficient. So if we just had constant returns of scale, meaning we didn't get any efficient as we got larger, and if all the land were equal and all the, all the people were equal in their ability to cultivate that land, then we would have no cities. There'd be no reason for, um, for cities. We, we would indeed all have kind of an equal plot of land, equal sized, equal distant, uh, apart, just doing um, whatever we're doing. And so relaxing these assumptions gives us cities all right without you know without if if the world was like this we would just have what's called the backyard uh production uh uh, model where there would be no cities but as we relax these assumptions getting us closer to the real world where land is different people are different and there are increasing returns to scale in production um then we will develop cities. Cities basically are result of having comparative advantage, um, meaning land is different in different areas and um, people are different in their comparative advantage and absolute advantage um, based on how compatible they are with that land and what the land produces. If you have comparative advantage, you will have trade. Trade um, induces city. Trade lends itself to cities and then increasing returns to scale also um, leads to centralization of production. Okay, so we'll start with the first one, equal productivity of land and labor. Again, just assuming that your land and labor is just as productive as my land and labor, but of course we differ in endowment and technology. So we differ in what the land can grow. We differ, we differ in our technological level, um, you know, what, you know what, what technology is available to us. And therefore, since there are differences, in intro economics, you should have learned, even if, you know, you're better at everything than me, we can still have a mutually beneficial trade. That's called comparative advantage. I will still have the comparative advantage in something. There are gains to trade. And so we should specialize and trade. Just to, you know, refresh your memory, here's an example. So let's say we have somebody called Stitch takes 12, uh, 12 hours, or no, they can, sorry, they can make 12 shoes per hour or two milks per hour versus squeeze who make one shoe per hour, one milk per hour. In this scenario, Stitch is better at everything. They can make more shoes, they can make more milk. Okay. Now, in opportunity cost terms though, what does this mean? Well, for squeeze is very easy. Every time squeeze makes a shoe, they're giving up milk. So if they spend an hour on a shoe, in that hour, they could have made one milk. So every time they make a shoe, they're giving up a, a milk. Every time they make a milk, they're giving up a shoe. For a stitch, it's a little more complicated. So let's say in a half hour, this person can make six shoes. In a half hour, they can make one milk. So every time I spend that half hour on milk, I'm giving up six shoes that I could have made. And then vice versa. Every time I'm making, um, spending that half hour on uh, sorry, not a half hour. So I can make uh, a shoe in five minutes. Um, 
every time I'm spending that five minutes on a shoe to make one shoe, I'm giving up a sixth of a gallon. That's how much I can make in those five minutes that it takes me to make a shoe. So for every milk I'm making, I'm giving up six shoes. I'm like fabulously productive in uh, uh, making shoes. Um, and so it's actually really expensive for me to make milk because of how good I am at making shoes. So you can think if you have like, if we're thinking about terms of land, some land's really, really productive at, you know, growing a certain crop. Any time I spend, you know, not growing that crop, I'm giving up a ton of that crop because of how productive it is or because of the technology that makes it super productive. So therefore, even though I'm better at making milk than squeeze, I really should just focus on shoes because I'm so much better at shoes. So these two people can gain because for this person, even though they're worse at, at milk, in opportunity cost terms, they're only giving up one shoe. Whereas I'm giving up six or Stitch is giving up six shoes. So these two people, people can trade even though this person's better at both of them because for them, it's just um, preferable to focus on shoes, trade for the milk with squeeze. So this is comparative advantage, all right? This is, this is one of the few ideas in social science that is true and non-obvious. So most of the time when you learn something in social science, like if, you, if there's some new social science research that's true, if you told that to a lay person, they would be like, yes, of course, that's common sense. You know, if you tell like some of the findings in economics or sociology or psychology that are true to, you know, um, you know, your grandma or something like that, they'll be like, yeah, of course, everyone knows that, you know, think about like supply and demand prices go up, people want to buy less. And when I first learned that in high school, I was like, really? It took uh, Adam Smith, the philosopher, to develop this concept, and he's like all famous for it. This is the most obvious thing in the world. Most things that are true in social science fall into that category. They're common sense or obvious. Things that are counterintuitive, so oftentimes they'll get huge press. Like there's some, some psychology study that will have, be, have some counterintuitive or weird result. Nine times out of 10, it turns out to not replicate, to be false. The other social sciences outside of economics, to some extent, economics are in a replicability crisis right now. None of the results replicate. A lot of the results, the big time results um, of the past 20, 30 years turn out to not have been true. Um, you know, you can go result by result. You know, I can give you in, in discussion, I can give you lists of things in psychology that are not, that were big, big studies that were not true. They did not replicate. So they are having a reproducibility crisis in the other fields. Economics to some extent has it as well. Um, but since economics is much more, the standards for publication are much more rigorous in terms of the robustness checks. And it's much more relying on, um, kind of real world data rather than, you know, lab data, um, then it's it's not as bad in economics as in other, other fields. But comparative advantage is one of those things where it's not intuitive, but true. And I, like I said, this is very, very rare to find something that's not intuitive true. So why is it not intuitive? It's not intuitive because Stitch is better at everything. How could they possibly gain from trading with somebody who's worse? And yet they can. And of course, this is the history of the world as, you know, societies have traded have done mutually beneficial exchanges with one another. The more trade a place has, the more open they are to trade, the richer the place has become. You can go back 2000 years and this is true. So it's true theoretically and then it's true when we, when we look out in the real world. Okay, so this, when we drop this assumption, once we say, okay, there is gonna, there's gonna be comparative advantage. We're gonna have specialization. That, lends itself to trade. Then you have trade. I specialize. We're going to need to trade. Okay. We have to have some way to exchange what I produced with what you produce. Once we have that, then we get trading cities, centers where that trade occurs. And typically these centers, these are areas that are easy to get to. Um, uh, they're like transportation hubs. So usually they're on water. Usually it's like, you know, some city that has a nice harbor. So you think, okay, and you can go through cities and realize that many cities have this origin. San Francisco, well, that's a great harbor, great for trading. San Diego, great harbor, great for trading. LA, not so much. We'll go, we'll go through the, uh, I have a history of LA, why LA is where, where LA is. And it's, it's not, it's not because the harbor, it does have a harbor, but it's not the, it's not the greatest harbor. Or do you think of New Orleans? New Orleans is at the end of the Mississippi. Um, 
So, you know, most cities through history, especially your older cities, like say your London's or um, um, I don't know, your Barcelona's, they have an origin as a trading Boston. Boston's one too. Yeah, they have an origin as a trading city. They were the center of local trade where goods would come from the hinterlands into that area, be shipped out, and farmers would acquire goods from overseas or other places. So once we have competitive advantage, once we have trade, we are going to get trading cities. So again, this is the original origin of many of these places. So as I mentioned, New Orleans. When the cotton gin gets invented in the late 18, or late 1700s, all of a sudden the U.S. is producing much more cotton. That cotton is being funneled down to uh, New Orleans. Um, and New Orleans really becomes this natural trading post. And you can see, boom, here is it's the share of U.S. population. And then it's kind of been declining uh, since then as, you know, you know, cotton gets less important in the U.S. economy as we go through time, as the U.S. becomes more industrialized. And then, you know, we go through the present um, as, as well. Okay, uh, let's take a break there and then we'll go through the constant return to scale. <laughs> 